Hey everybody, uh, this is Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman from the Hello. Cinematography Podcast. Hello, uh, and we're here doing uh, another really cool panel. We have uh, we have uh, three uh, kick-ass DPs uh, who are doing some of the stuff at the cutting edge of television right now, including shows like uh, Watchmen, Holy Crap, Moon Knight, the upcoming Moon Knight, Fear the Walking Dead, uh, and Saved by the Bell. Holy crap! Very, very exciting. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, please join us in in welcoming our panelists. Uh, first up, you can see his cinematography work on HBO's Watchmen and the upcoming Marvel show Moon Knight. Please welcome Gregory Middleton. Uh, and then uh, next we have the cinematographer uh, for uh, several episodes of Fear the Walking Dead. Please welcome Fernando Ahuelas. Yes. Hi. How are you doing? Before Fear the Walking Dead, I've done other shows that I consider as, as important or more than Fear the Walking Dead. You have done so many amazing shows, and, and I definitely so, want to so, so you are identifying me with Fear the Walking Dead, and uh, <laughs> more than that. So uh, I'll, I'll take the last one. Uh, last but not least, you can see his work in saved by the bell please welcome tom mcgill hi everybody thanks for having me thanks for being on here tom so uh you know we kind of want to start with uh you know the question that i think is, is 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 the most interesting and like what was the moment in your life when being a cinematographer occurred to you as like a career path you could pursue the shortest i can say this there's no the moment it's just a progression it's mm -hmm. a progression of things that have influenced you the movies you have watched people that you have met uh, and a certain uh, artistic inclination to to work in a still. That's how I started. And then it went into motion pictures. So you started with still photography. Yes, I did start with, with still photography, but always have that uh, uh, desire to go into the image and movement, uh, meaning motion pictures, uh, photography that uh, in, 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 in movies. And uh, that was probably around when I was 13, I started with a still thing, 14. Uh, I was very inclined to painting. In fact, I tried to be a painter, but I, I was awful. Of <laughs> I was pretty bad. So, you know, um, it was kind of a natural, natural progression getting into photography and then uh, motion pictures photography. And, and like when you got into photography, the idea was you were going to move into cinematography eventually. Like you were, were you into photography as its own art form or was it something that you were using as a stepping stone to the next thing, which you knew would be uh, motion pictures? No, as a passion, as an art form, mm -hmm. as uh, something that I wanted to do. It wasn't. It didn't have extra plans on it. I mean, it wasn't. It was something that I really, I really liked, and I wanted to to, uh, to do, which was photography. Yes. How about you, Tom? Uh, where, you know, like, what was the? Was there a lightning bolt, or was it just a progression? There, there were actually two moments for me. One, I remember being six or seven years old and looking at a black and white portrait book my my mm. family had, and somehow feeling connected to images. But it wasn't until probably my mid twenties, I was working in news and had the chance, I was actually an editor uh, where I started my career, had made a jump to edit for a documentary company, had the opportunity to shoot for them one night. They were doing a documentary in a level one trauma center. So I spent an overnight shift following a trauma surgeon around like a little DV cam. And by coincidence that night, you know, the whole world fell apart and everything came through the trauma center. And so much of what I shot just by dumb luck made the documentary. Oh, wow. Something about, you know, I was 25, I think. Something about shooting that documentary and being in the middle of all that chaos and being in the field and then seeing everything cut together and edited, it just sort of felt like, oh my God, I can do this. Like, this is something that I have that obviously I would need to learn a lot more about, but that was the foundation of what got me started shooting. And oh, what about you, Greg? Uh, I love how we're all so different. This is the thing I find fascinating about yeah. uh, cinematographers is uh, is the different backgrounds. The uh, okay, I have, I have a three three part answer, but I'll make it quick. I think so. You asked me when I, when it occurred to me. So the um, uh, I went to the film school, and and in the summer after film school, they used to lend the equipment at the school I went to to a grad student to make like a sort of a thesis feature or something, and they have to use students as crew. And so I spent the summer volunteering on that, um, working as a camera operator in this tiny sixteen millimeter black and white film, and. But while while doing that every day for like 40 days, I, I realized I didn't really want to go back. I couldn't really imagine not being involved that way or just being around the camera. I really got hooked on it. And then the, the second part of that, because I've been making films since I was a kid, like in Super 8, things like that. Um, and the second part was when 
one of my best friends was working as a second assistant on a, a film called Leaving Normal that was shot here in Vancouver, where I am mm-hmm. right now. Uh, shot by Ralph Boda. Uh, so he was an amazing cinematographer who did Gorky Park and Coal Miner's oh, Daughter, Saturday yeah. Fever. And really amazing, interesting guy. He's a German, German-born German American. And he uh, and uh, I asked him, I said, would he, would, he, would he ask him if I could come watch him work? And he was very kind and very mentally let me watch some stuff, watch dailies with him. And and got to visit the set. And what I found so fascinating was Ralph's background was as an actor. And then he, when he was drafted in uh, to the army during Vietnam, he got put in the photography corps and learned how to become a photographer and became a documentary. But his sort of natural instincts were storytelling and acting. And that was the thing he gravitated to the most in terms of the storytelling. He wasn't necessarily a photographer uh, initially, but he was very interested in the script and, uh, and relationship with the, with the cast. And I didn't really know if I fit a, a profession as a cinematographer, I didn't know, like, what do you have to be? Do you have to be X, Y, or Z or all these one things? As I learned now later, look, all of us are all quite different. And you all, you know, do really interesting work. I mean, Fernando and Tom do amazing stuff. And then we've all come from totally different backgrounds. And Ralph mm-hmm. taught me that that was, that was something that was possible. I could be my unique self and still maybe fit into the profession later. So uh, mm. that was a huge inspiration. I feel I feel like that's the story we keep hearing over and over again, like, you know, because we interview so many people and they all have such radically different backgrounds is that like, really, it is what you what it's actually the strength, what from yourself you bring to it that that makes you different. The, the common link is there's no common link. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a, certainly a love of it and there's certainly a love of the, like part of the role and whatever part of the role it is, I find. And uh, and the last part was when I end up working on a TV series called The Killing. Um, also mm. in Vancouver, I got to work with a lot of really interesting directors. And now I had never imagined working in series necessarily. And I just remember at one point driving to work, I was just grinning because I was uh, enjoying what I was doing so much with the amazing people I had. So that was like the third part was like, okay, I guess I can fit. Now I realized I could fit in. I did fit in. I was doing okay on the show and I really enjoyed it and I loved the people. So it was sort of a three-part answer. Well, and I want to kind of back up and ask you uh, kind of a follow-up, though, which is uh, you were in film school already. So uh, what was the film school, and what did you think you were going to do in, in the film world when you went to film school? Well, um, I was born in Canada, and I was like, originally it was like, I have to go to USC. That's where everyone wants to go in the era that I was grew up in. But that proved to be financially totally impossible uh, and uh, too far away. So I ended up going to um, – uh, UBC, actually, University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, which had a very tiny program. I read a lot of books about the filmmakers I admired when I was younger, and it's all the schools that became quite large institutions later, when they went through, the schools were tiny, and a small faculty, and it, it seemed, uh, what you put into it seemed as important to what you, got, what you would get out of it in terms mm. of the institution or what was available. So I sort of took that as the a metric that a small a school with a small program wasn't necessarily a detriment and it turned out to be quite good and it was a great experience to just you know learn a little bit about doing a bit of everything and getting your feet into a bit of everything greg it sounds like uh film school of course was was important uh, how about for uh for everyone else how was uh how was was there a film school or did film school play a role in uh in in your development uh you know uh tom fernando either one of you i yep. i didn't go to film school it wasn't really an option for me. I didn't know at that age, cinematography and TVs or movies was a possibility. I grew up back East, kind of in a small town. So it wasn't like I lived in New York or LA where that was sort of around all the time. So I went a year uh, junior college just because that's all I could afford. The goal was to eventually get to a better school, which where I was in Philadelphia was Temple University. Didn't love the junior college did a year, it was terrible for me. And then I said, I'm gonna take a year off. I'm gonna work full time, I'm gonna save a bunch of money and then go back to a better school and then start that journey over. And it was that year that I took off, I got my first job. And again, that was you know doing news in Philadelphia, editing news, shooting a little bit. And I sort of was like, well, I'm not really gonna go back. But having you know, the, the hindsight now looking back had that, if that was an option, I think I probably would have pursued film school. I feel like there's some value there. There's not a right or wrong answer, but just the experience is something I don't think I quite got that would have been beneficial in some foundation stuff for, for the career. Uh, my, my two cents on that is that I talk to people who go to film school have a incredible experience and then also a terrible experience and everything in between. So I think it totally yeah. depends. And I don't think that you're at a real disadvantage not I having think it's gone. the individual. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not good or bad. It's whatever, you know, you're, you're trying to pursue and get out of it. 
I think that's exactly it. I think that everyone gets out of it what they put into it, and that's that's really the that's. Also, I just think some people are going to flourish more in a scholastic environment. Even I don't know the film school I went to was not rigidly structured, but still, just you're going to function better in that in that environment. And some people just want to go get work, and they just want to go get their feet wet and and, and start building. Yeah, it depends also on like how many people in your class and how you relate. It's like it's a it's a bit of a team sport, right? So yeah. Well, okay, so. I went to film school. Uh, actually, my, my Spanish between two continents. I mm. studied in the University of Madrid, film school mm. uh, in Spain. Uh, then I founded a company with other friends. We started doing short films. We ended up doing a, a feature film that it was shown in the San Sebastian Festival. It had some, some success. And then uh, I went to the AFI. I got a scholarship a Fulbright scholarship to go to the American Film Institute. Oh, nice. I did the 85, 86, thank you, 86, 87. Uh, And uh, to answer your question, uh, I think the first year at AFI was very good. The second year, not that, I I didn't find as much value as the first year. Uh, I came with an idea of photography that was more uh, European, uh, more uh, the use of less equipment and less lights and all of that kind of thing that sometimes we get very, uh, very much uh, busy with. Uh, But uh, my answer about if it's worth it or not, the, the film school, it was for me because I don't think film school is just they're going to show you how to load the magazine. That was before. <laughs> or how to put a cable now or that kind of stuff. Yeah, film yeah. school is a place in which you share ideas, you uh, network, you uh, find friends that probably they are going to be with you uh, in the future in your career. It happened to me that way. Uh, I met great people at AFI, uh, uh, and at AFI there is right there are writers, there are production designers, and so on and on. So really, it's like a, a very small Hollywood inside the school. That's what uh, I think the AFI was, and I think it's it's worth it. I think it's very expensive, and that's the part that I have a problem with. You know, that is so expensive that it only applies to some to people with money. Or, mm. <laughs> or people willing to put money. themselves into into massive yeah. debt. I mean, yeah. who is going to pay ninety thousand dollars for a AFI one year program? You know, I yeah. mean, you have to have some money. Or I mean, once you get out and you start working as a PA, you just pay that off like almost <laughs> immediately. <laughs> it's like two weeks, you're done. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's not. That is not exactly true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not exactly true. I get out and I was doing I, I was doing a feature film just after I get out. And one of the actors in that feature film was Sam Raimi. It was the whole Sam Raimi group. And it oh, was what was the film? film? That was the, uh, I tell you later, I, I had to remember. It was Night Crew. It was called Night Crew. I'm the biggest Sam Raimi dork who ever lived. So yeah. He, he and his brother acted in that movie. Ted? But yeah. uh, that was 1989. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the producer was uh, the, the, the guy that um, produced uh, Tarantino's first movies. Uh, Lawrence Bender? Lawrence Bender. Well, exactly. Yeah. Lawrence Bender. So, the, how I got that connection was through AFI, was through a guy that his name his name is Doug Hessler that called me to, to shoot that feature. The director of that movie was Scott the Spiegel. Maybe you find it online. Right I now. do know Scott Spiegel. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know Scott Spiegel personally, but of course I know who he is. Co-wrote The Evil Dead 2, and I have a whole Scott Spiegel story, but I won't, I won't bore you with it. <laughs> so all of that group, I did the, that feature. The first Intruder. I love that movie. It came from you know, be friends and network yeah. at AFI. I was lucky. Some of the people, maybe they go to a PA, like you said. Yeah. Just, you know, it's a little put down to say somebody trying to <laughs> put it on, then works a PA like a laugh. I, I'm, I'm, I don't mean, I honestly don't mean to imply that. I'm just saying that like when, you, when you're when you right out of film school, you're lucky that you were able to go shoot a movie like Intruder, which is a movie I have seen several times, by the way. So I, you know. I, 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 I was, and I had another movie before that that was called Prime Suspect. Mm-hmm. So I was one of the lucky ones, and I understand yeah. you. Know, many people, they, they go into another, another field, so yeah. they, are, they are gaffers, yeah, yeah. They are assistants, and all of that. But I think film school, I recommend for a, a general, general knowledge. You know, schools are good. I yeah. am in favor of schools. 
and and you learned the lesson of meeting people, you know, creatively very early in school, which a lot of people didn't right away. It took them years later, and you learned right away. Oh wow, this is how you meet people that are in sync exactly. with you, and how things that's exactly connect, right. and that's how and that's how it works even now, right? Even that's been working exactly. for 25, 30 years. So. That's I, but I think that that dovetails really well into, uh, you know, kind of our, our next question, which is sort of about like building your way up in the industry. Um, and and uh, we find this on the podcast a lot where there are some people who it's like when they start, they like hang out a shingle. I'm a cinematographer. They're going down that path and they'll just work on lower budget stuff and, and move up. Some people are like, I'm going to go work in, in a, the electric department. I'm going to go work in the camera department and work my way up to being a DP that way. So, uh, uh, so let's start with with you, Tom, and 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 uh, talk about kind of your process of how you got to be a cinematographer. You know, uh, you know, on 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 TV, which is you know, that is the that that's the probably the biggest goal anyone's got right now out there. People making uh, people going to film school or whatever. It's definitely a great time to be working in TV with all the streaming services and all the yeah online stuff. Like it's incredible. I I didn't set out to. St- you know, when I was going through working on documentaries, the goal wasn't, you know, I'm going to DP half hour comedies one day. Like, that's the yeah. only thing I want yeah. to do. I had no idea. I kind of started the route of documentary, which, you know, I did for a couple of years. And just by dumb accident, that led me into reality TV, which was sort of that handheld documentary style of shooting. And that was back in the day when you'd be hard pressed to find any reality TV on your TV, there were maybe three shows. Yeah, so yeah. I sort of went down that road just because I was able to keep working and support myself having moved to LA. And I was also having the the opportunity to travel the world, which was incredible and meet some incredible people, even though maybe the content I was working on wasn't like anything I was like really, really passionate about, but I loved shooting and I loved being in different environments. So I sort of enjoyed trying to shoot a little bit of everything. Some sports I've, I've done in my life, some reality TV, a lot of news, news features that eventually led me to operating on a show called The Office, which was that handheld doc style. Mm. So having you know, 10 plus years of that doc reality experience where, you know, the camera's on your shoulder for 12 hours a day and you're pulling your own focus and you're just running around like like crazy. I mean, that was the perfect fit for an opportunity to get into the office. So I kind of got into the scripted comedy world that way and just operated for a long time. And then eventually on a show had the opportunity to bump up and sort of took it from there. Yeah, well, I mean, and you're sort of at the, at the cutting, like so many shows have stolen the, the look and concept and feel of The Office that it's almost become its own visual language. Like, you know, as soon as you see that kind of docu-style shooting in comedy, like it clues you in to kind of the, you know, the, the, the timing and stuff. Can you talk about like... What, I mean, like how you're coming, you're coming from a background of, of shooting live events, documentaries, uh, reality shows, and you're, you're put in that position. Uh, did it, did your methodology or anything change, uh, you know, now that you're doing something that's more narrative? Yeah, very much so. Some things were easier. Some things were a little more of a challenge. Uh, the show, the style of the show was created, you know, the look of the show, that style by a guy named uh, Randall Einhorn, who Mm. I had worked with in the documentary reality world also. The B operator was this guy named Matt Sohn, who went on to DP a lot of stuff. He now directs, they both direct now pretty much full time. So coming in, kind of learning a different way, a, a different set, the way a different set works. And, you know, that very specific style, which when you look at it, feels very zoomy and panny and whip pans all over the place. But there's a very specific theory behind when you would move, when you would kind of make a move or die for something. And the thing that's great about that is, you know, you have the option and the ability as an operator, if you feel something or see something, you can just go grab something. It's not like this pass, we're going to hold the two until we get the performance we want. Then we'll go in and we'll do some coverage. We'll go closer. You're free to kind of go all over the place. Yeah. So it was sort of... You're you're basically a character on that show. Yeah, very much so. They created a, a really kind of interesting look that I don't think was really done at that time up until that point. So the other thing that was really challenging is, you know, you would have these giant bullpen scenes where you have like eight or 12 people and you have to almost memorize the scene because you're at this corner for this line and then you got to whip over here and be ready to get this one at this line. So you're almost learning the dialogue as if you're like you were saying a character on the show. Yeah. 
So it was, it was really fun. It was a great, great education. Like my first time into the scripted comedy world. So I'm very thankful for that experience. And it's, it's a show that obviously has some teeth. It's, on Comedy Central, twenty four hours a day still. Yeah, it's it's, it's meme worthy, and it's been having been off the air as long as it is, and you know people are constantly dropping memes of it. And if you if you're familiar with that show, man, you 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 just know you know those moments. So, uh, Tom, can I ask Tom a question quickly? Please, one, please one, do. The one thing about the Office about that style comedy too is what I think is really fascinating. Tom is that there's as much as as the mem- memorizing the dialogue is important so much of what you're shooting are the looks right which are not yeah. the lines do you know what i mean like yeah. there's a whole subset of which is a great thing which you don't really get when you're learning about script and and drama is that like yeah i mean the dialogue is not the scene the scene is the, what's played going on between the actors and you guys are always on the office you're always at the because the look is almost the usually the joke more is the reaction to anything else which is which you guys play so beautifully so it's like you have to know the scene but you're also looking for that right were you conscious of that early on yeah, hundred uh, percent. I don't know if I was. It was something that I'm sure I picked up that was subconscious, which is also what's great about being an operator on a show like The Office is you you know you have this freedom and you're pulling your own focus. So it would be so hard to just dive to some part of a room if there's a reaction that someone is giving that they haven't done before and you want to try to grab mm-hmm. it. It would be really, really hard to have your first AC try to keep up. You would just buzz everything. In that style of the show, you know, a little bit of a buzz focus here and there adds to it. But you're you're basically given freedom to just kind of go after whatever you want. And even if you went somewhere and the reaction didn't play, you know, you could do another take. You, you know it'll be there the next time or they have you go do something else. But it, so much of it is is the reactions, not necessarily, you know, the dialogue stuff. Yeah, well, and I hadn't even thought about that. So thank, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, like when I think about the memes that of the office, it's often one of the characters kind of looking at the camera, like, uh, you know, like it's a and, reaction and, shot. Yeah, I know, and and that's like you guys were brilliant about capturing that, and and again, I think created a style of that. Yeah, that's that's all Randall Einhorn and Matt Sohn. Yeah. Oh well, let's move on to uh, to you, Greg. Like, what what was your uh, what what was your kind of pathway? And at some point, you have to talk about Slither because I, I I can't I, I can't not mention <laughs> Slither. Slither, yes. Oh God, yeah. I love that. Uh, I'm proud of that uh, wacky movie. The um, uh, well, let me. I'll try and keep this kind of brief. The um, so I ended up uh, being pretty fortunate. I actually worked at Panavision over one summer when I was in school just cleaning filters, learning cameras. And I got taken out as an assistant a few times. And I realized I didn't really have the temperament necessary to be an assistant like for a super long time. And I was figuring out what to do. I read a bunch of books about how other cinematographers had started. Uh, and it seemed maybe shooting more and more of myself might be better for me. So I shot a whole bunch of student film, student films and films after school to try and build up something. And then similar to that, uh, that summer I spent, I told you about when I started and I was off camera running on this little tiny student feature. Yeah. Five years later, the production designer, who was a good friend of mine at the school, uh, it was her turn to make a film, and I shot that feature film that was like a little tiny, made for seventy thousand dollars, shot in sixteen mil, art house film called Kissed, uh, starring, starring Molly Paul Parker, is about a female necrophile. Oh, I I'm very familiar with that film, actually. Yeah, yeah, I think have we talked about this? We we might have discussed this once, but um, anyway, that was the beginning of. That was at least me, you know, authoring a, a feature length thing as a cinematographer. And once I had one thing to show, then another filmmaker can see it. And that's how I actually met Jeremy Podeswa. I shot his second film and he's a filmmaker I met in Toronto. We'd, he'd seen the film and met Lynn. And that was sort of the beginning of a career. It's really about just you have to make something to show. It's like the Cash 22, which we've all had. It's like you can't get a job until you've done a job. And that was the beginning of getting into some small art house cinema. And I did a, a lot of films in that genre. And then when James Gunn did Slither, he you know he had a few choices for cinematographers. Like you know what, I mean, I'll take the guy who's done the weird movie about having sex with dead people, mm. uh, more of an art house type thing. That was for the right call. That, he he gravitated to something like that more than just someone who'd done a lot of series at the time. And I was grateful for it. James is a hilarious character, and the I've never laughed so hard at all during a shoot. It's incredibly stressful. It's a very low budget movie for what it was. It was only about fourteen or fifteen million for something that was really? you know a, oh yeah that script was thirty million. We were constantly trying to figure out how to cut things down and. Um, but it was a, it was a, but that it got me, you know, gets you approval to the next. It's all about getting approval for the next, like, scale of production. And also, filmmakers could then describe how they like working with you to somebody else. And that's sort of, you sort of learn that early on. It's like you want to be, 
you want to, I, I want to finish a project and have the people I'm working with think, I don't want to do another project without Greg, not just, mm, you know, do yeah. good work, but you want to be hopefully um, a good asset to them and a good uh, collaborator. And that's sort of the part of it. So, but that was the first thing that started my actual professional career. Cause then I had enough stuff to start and that would lead to more jobs. And you sort of just sort of work one, one after the other from that. Well, and Fernando, you already kind of touched on it a little bit, but if you could talk, I mean, like, so, you know, you, you went to school in Spain and then you went to AFI and, you know, from intruder on where was that, were you all DP at that point or, uh, you know, were you, you know, bumping down to operator or something on other projects? Pretty much was all DP from there on. Uh, I love operating. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I don't love the handheld shoot everything you want, but sometimes, sometimes <laughs> plastic. You know, everything you move, just shoot it. Yeah. I'm already be in that sense. I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, nothing wrong with that, but I gotta say it. Uh, You're fired from the office. More like Gordon Willis, kind of thing. But anyway, so <laughs> uh, yeah, it was DP from there on. From there on was DP. Uh, I kept doing uh, uh, features and then. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, there was uh, back in uh, the end of the 90s, it was like uh, uh, an offer to do a TV show in Spain. And I took it. Uh, it was an American TV show shot in nearby Madrid. And I took it. And then, you know, I got hooked up with TV, uh, working for the networks, uh, Prison Break, uh, all of those shows. Yeah, yeah. amazing stuff. Seven, eight. Uh, thank you. Uh, Swamp Thing. You know, Swamp Thing does not get enough love. That show is beautiful and wonderful. It's an, a beautiful looking work on that show. And, right I'm, and I'm friends with Derek Mears, and I was so excited to see Derek get to play a role like that because he's so perfect. But everything was perfect about that show. Let me tell you, Derek was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, no good. I, I I can tell you that I was there looking at the guy, and I, he's the swamp thing. He's so good. He's the swamp thing. I mean, I would keep that suit and live with it for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, dude, he took it, and uh, you know, I'm very proud of that show. It was a very risky show. We went very dark. I love that you did that, though, because, you know, yeah, there was that original Swamp Thing from the 80s, the Wes Craven movie, and then there was the TV series, and, 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 it, and it went so campy eventually. And Swamp Thing is such a creepy-ass character and such a, such a, such a, a grotesque, creepy world. I was so excited to see you, your whole team kind of take that seriously and go in the direction that that character is designed to be, you know? Yes, it, it, it was taken very seriously. Uh, we have uh, the company, what is Atomic Monster, James Wan, I think, company that was mm. the one who was producing it. We were, we, everybody was very clear to do a different show, to do, yeah. you know, uh, you know, it wasn't another uh, uh, Flash or, or the Arrow or. or you know, these shows, they're all great and all that, but we wanted to take another route, a much darker route, a more, you know, a different style with horror, suspense, and thrillerish and whatnot. So, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm working now for, uh, like all of us, for uh, mostly streaming services, uh, but I started with the networks. And, mm. and what I wanted to say when I did Prison Break, it was Fox Television. And we thought, mm. I thought that was going to be fire. I said, this really? Episode, yeah, because Prison Break had nothing to do pretty much with the TV, previous TV. You know, guys, the, yeah. the one is everything bright, everything, you know, totally. the moves and there are three shadows. One goes that way, <laughs> goes that way, the other goes that way. So what is the light coming from? That kind of, uh, and uh, and I think in, they let us do, uh, and I think that paid off. And it was like, I think, I think, I don't want to sit, sit, brag on this, but I think Prison Break kind of was his own show in the realm of network TV. Well, and, and I feel like at that time, too, you have shows like 24 and Prison Break that, that are that are going that dark, you know, that are that are are kind of exploring cinematography in a way that network TV hadn't done previously very much. That's what we will look for. And yeah, uh, you, you, you got to create mood for your story, which yeah. TV did not like. Exactly. You actually got to exactly. create mood for the story. Yeah, but, <laughs> but before that, before that, I mean, uh, at that time with network TV, Greg, guys, they, they didn't let you do it. 
No. They, who they told you, we want to see. They didn't like darkness. They no. didn't like, they came to us through the producers. We don't want like, you know, dark and I mean, we want to a certain, but the thing has been changed. One thing I just want to make this, uh, I don't want to extend myself, but one thing that changed was the, the uh, Netflix and the streaming services. Mm. I did the first show, Hemlock Grove. There were two shows that Netflix started with, um, House of Cards and Hemlock Grove. Yeah, the Grove was that kind of horror. that was in Toronto, by the way. Yeah, and uh, you know we did whatever we wanted, and I and that moment to me was the first time I felt completely free to be a cinematographer when I did that show for Netflix. It was the very beginning of Netflix. Yeah, that was even before House of Cards, if I'm not mistaken. Right? That's correct. And it's like, uh, it's a, I, I love that show and it's, I'm, I'm a, a, a super horror fan. I, I, I love all the werewolfy stuff that you guys are doing in that. Yeah, uh, we created some very strange stuff. You know, we, I yeah. used some Estorado je- yellow yeah. that really make it seem so yellow and things and whatnot. That's so cool. And I felt myself as, as a cinematographer and artist as well, the first time that I felt freedom. Well, in that in that early kind of nascent days of Netflix, were they like, do whatever, guys, like we got to get attention or were they trying to be more like network television? No, they no. it was do do your thing. That is yeah, so they want, sweet. They're trying to define to not be network TV. Right. So they were exactly. you know, let Red Fernando be a filmmaker because we're going to be different. And even if they don't even they're new to it. Yeah, and they they didn't exactly know what to expect from this. You know what I'm mm. saying? I mean, you have HBO, that always been HBO, and but Netflix just came in, so they let us. There was total freedom. We did. I did two years. I didn't do the third year, um, and they gave us total freedom, and they treat us like amazing. I mean, I I had a driver twenty four hours a day. Things really. Like, yeah. Oh my God. The, the things like that. The, that that was uh, that was like. Uh, but it was it was great to work. Uh, as I said, the first time I felt. Uh, real freedom as a cinematographer. I don't know. Netflix has changed a lot, guys. You know, you work for Netflix. It has changed a lot. Oh, it's yeah. It's, it's very different. It's yeah, it's becoming a, a bit more of a network. They have more of their oh, own yeah. rules now. It's now it's it's a different a different game. But I got to say, like we've we've had some of the DPs from various Netflix shows, including Ozark, and you know o- Ozark is so dark. Like I, I I was just so blown away with like it, you know doing a show that takes place so much of it outside during the daylight, and they still manage to make it like dark and dense and and beautiful. And 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 I feel like you know that's the thing when I know I'm, when I'm putting on an HBO Max show or I'm putting on a Netflix or you know depending on what it is, they 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 rarely look like uh, what I. think think of as network television mm. Mm. that is correct that is correct yeah. I think it's I think it's really interesting that the streaming networks are getting more I'd say more like the traditional networks or studios and especially in acquiring existing properties or properties of you know uh adapting pre-existing material and uh greg i want to switch gears a little bit for you here because i know that you've done a lot of uh projects like watchmen and now moon knight which are are based on uh you know graphic novels can you talk a little bit about the process of adapting something that is you know beloved and well known in, for the screen that's uh yeah it's interesting because the two the two although they're both based on comics the two are very different projects in terms of their like how they're uh started when um i think just quickly about watchmen when um when i started that which i did did four four episodes four and a half episodes that's like half half the series right yeah and i i I didn't do the pilot andre uh um directed the pilot did a beautiful job and we also knew nikki the director that we both know her and uh i did i did we reshot some of it when we built some new sets but the bigger thing what because they'd done the pilot, we had a, a, quite a bit of time between finishing the pilot and then prepping for the reshoots to starting the series to spend more time to develop like a visual language and look at like, hey, what in this did it work? What in the, in the comic we want to bring out? Because what's interesting about the graphic novel is 
of just a couple of basic concepts we were go through. One is like colors, representation. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of things in a graphic novel where the one is everything's going to focus, right? Like in Zoom right now, everything behind yeah. us is all sharp. Well, mostly when we shoot film, we don't do that. And the taste, there's a lot of taste now for much shallower focus. But there's things in the graphic novel you can do like that where you let the eye wander around, right? You keep things in focus because you're putting graphic things, storytelling things mm. in each picture that they're drawing. And we wanted to do a bit more like that, a bit more static camera and do that. So we use some split diopters, some deeper focus occasionally to create things like that. That was one element of graphics storytelling we wanted to bring out. Uh, and then also we were embracing the film noir because The Watchman is essentially like a film noir mystery thing, which is a bit like The Killing, which Nikki and I worked on before, and some of those film noir lighting tropes in it. But like those are two elements we brought into it. But you want to want you want to make it so it can be a, a, if you are a fan of the comic and interested there's an area of interest there that you know might be an extra bit of interest like an easter egg like what damon would say was always putting easter eggs in the comic in every possible way to elements of the story if you knew it because he knew the thing about inside and out he was an incredible fan of it before but the thing is it has to work visually on its own as its own interpretation right and everything i mean comics are completely rewritten usually like moon knights had several runs with various other artists and you know just like uh, comic artists and writers to take their own take on something and when you're making an adaptation you are making your own version of what this character or this thing is so it's be mindful of it's nice to include things but you don't want to be a slave to it and make it like something else it is its own entity if you know what i mean so like we tried like for um, moon knight for example which i can't get into specifics obviously but there's a you know he's a you know he's a character with you know if you know the comic multiple personalities things like that there's an element of kind of, of darkness to the character in terms of like a mystery and unknown there's there's a whole run where in the comics he doesn't know if anything's real his personalities are real or conchu is real mm -hmm. And, you know, if we play with any ideas like that, then that invites some ideas of like, well, we could use darkness as a, as, a, as a storytelling element. Then we can leave things more dark, which, again, is not like what you do in TV. And also, frankly, what Marvel has not done too much of in their work, like their stuff is you do see more stuff in their world. There's a lot of deep visual stuff in, in their stuff. And we were, well, we should hide some more things. And um, that became an early part of the conversation. So you're sort of trying to find a language that will really express the, the take on what you're making visually no matter where it is. And if you can pull some things out that make sense from uh, its origin story, or it's, it's, a, it's you know, the other artists that helped create the other versions of it, then great. But it does have to sort of work with its own thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it very much does make sense. And, um, you know, there's a lot of elements to something that's two-dimensional and, and it's in a graphical form that you then are getting to do your own interpretation of. And I, I don't mean to keep coming back to, to, to Slither, but um, uh, I, I know do. that was... The <laughs> I know that that was uh... Some tentacles well, coming out here. Just a little, little. little <laughs> one, was... one thing, uh, one thing I, I would like to add here. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in Swamp Thing came from Alan Moore's uh, graphic novel. Mm -hmm. uh, you take the graphic novel, and you you do an interpretation of that. You can. Uh, it's, it's, it, the graphic novel is almost like a storyboard, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. You know, of the the kind of framing. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, we. We uh, what uh, what Greg said was very interesting about not moving the camera. If you look at the Swamp Thing, there is no camera movement, very little, and yeah. everything is pretty much organic. We didn't have the yeah, it's, composition. It's, it's, it's composition. The composition is the, the almost <laughs> a Kurosawa three people composition, which is the triangulation of composition. But furthermore, we didn't do any 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 very little VFX. Most of it was organic uh, uh, in, in the in, in, on the in side, camera in the stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, just answering to that, you take interpretation from the graphic novel and you apply what you think is right for the, for the, um, for the show. And, of course, the executives and so runners are going to look yeah. at it. And if you sneak in, like if Fernando, did you make, did, is there one shot that was, was there a panel in Swamp Thing where, you, where someone, oh, we should just do exactly something like this once? Was there a couple panels you pulled out that maybe... You almost imitated in the show because we did a couple of oh, Watchmen just yeah. for fans of it. They were yeah, yeah, just <laughs> for, uh, yeah. That's, uh, the the uh, also we have a lot of stage. I assume that Watchmen I would have seen. You have a lot of stage as well. Uh, in, in, mixture, in, yeah, uh, mixture. We have uh, we have lagoons. We have actually uh, real yeah. lagoons. I mean, uh, 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 it built in the stages. So that uh, that restricted some of the freedom of going mm -hmm. everywhere, but. You know, that's... 
uh, I was just going to bring up Slither one last time, and then I promise we can move on from Slither. Uh, no, never. Uh, I know that it was uh, it was supposedly at least uh, Gun uh, publicly said that it was highly inspired by a, a Japanese manga called Uzumaki, and I was just wondering if like if you guys were 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 really getting into it and taking trying to take like graphical elements and bring it into it, or was was the look of that wholly original? I mean, I'm just wondering if you if if you went all the way back to that source material. It's interesting you bring that up, actually, because uh, there's now, as I remember, I'm trying to, I don't have that. I don't think I have that that graphic novel anymore. There's some particularly horrifying images in that. It's very high contrast in terms of mm. its design. And this is this thing with all these teeth and stuff. And it's like, it's pretty horrific. Um, it was more the tone of, like, for him, it was like like a horror comedy does not mean it's not horrible. You know what I mean? Like, there's a horror sure. element that, like, it can be completely grotesque and everything else. And so we can lean into like horror movie lighting, but also it is also funny. And so visually trying to honor both those things, I think the horror element, he was, he was reaching from like, this is how dark, like this is going to fuck you up reading this comic. Pardon my language. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to mess you up reading this comic. Um, but that was like, that's to, to how, 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 weird and awful it can get right like this guy eat, ends up eating like a bunch of you know stray pets and stuff i mean this is a pretty horrible thing but also it's hilarious so he was leaning on it as a tonal thing for that like the little yeah. kids gleeking rich was something we almost had to cut out and i was begging him like just we'll save three shots just let's only do three we can't cut it out of the script it's too funny because it does it both it's both hilariously grotesque and also very funny um and it was about trying to find that balance i think with him for the most part I, I kind of I, I know that we're talking about dark and comic books and all that stuff, but Tom, you're you're here doing you know uh, uh, comedy, uh, you know TV comedy, the brightest with, genre on the planet. With uh, in general, yeah, with 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 Saved Parks by the Bell, rec. yeah, uh, see the eyes. <laughs> so it's not funny you know, if it's dark, guys. Not funny if it's dark, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so so tell me, like, so with Saved by the Bell, you're kind of rebooting a, a classic, you know, from our from our childhoods. A lot of us. Uh, you know, like how how did you take on uh, that process? What did you take from the original? How did you modernize it or build on it? Or you know, like what what were the parallels or the or the breaking points? The things that were different. It's a good question. When I came on to do season one, I had already worked with the showrunner and the executive producer on another show a couple of years before. So they kind of reached out. Our one of our original producers, his name is uh, Franco Barrio. He actually worked on the original. So he, for him, it was this whole weird 360 thing where it's coming back to do a reboot of a show. He already did the original, you know, way back when I was in high school when Saved by the Bell was on TV. I didn't, yeah. I didn't really watch it. I don't think I was a target audience and it aired Saturday mornings probably at like eight or nine. And when you're in high school, you're not up or I wasn't up Saturday morning at eight or nine watching TV. I was still sleeping. So I sort of, you know, the, the, the note that was given to me about doing the re reboot was they said the original, because it was Saturday mornings and it was bookend between actual cartoons. So they chose to make the original look as much like a cartoon as they could so they could hold as much of the audience. For I the never show thought about that. Show after. So that's sort of why it's pretty interesting why that yeah. show looks the way it does. So they wanted obviously to bring it modern day. Uh, we're, we're at NBC, it's, it's streaming. So they said, we want to have some of the DNA and some of the thread from the original carried in to a modern day feel. And that was kind of the only note that was given to me. So to kind of bring it more cinematic feeling and more current day, we shot as directional as we could. We shot on primes. So, you know, we could go to a two if we had to and, you know, have a really beautiful shallow depth of field. We were trying to get the lighting. A lot of comedies generally are lit from above, especially like the mockumentary shows like, you know, The Office or Parks and Rec. You're almost 360. So the lighting has to be, you know, in the perms or on the, you know, from from the ceiling. So for this, we tried to go as directional as we could and we tried to bring the lighting down and make it feel more cinematic. And we would sort of push things when we could, there are school dances they have. So, you know, we're able to darken those up a little bit and any any chance we had to give it a current day feel through lighting or some camera movements, which we tried to play kind of as static as we could as well, just to kind of give it sort of its own unique feel, even though we're still trying to carry the thread from the original with some of the color palettes and some of the brighter colors of the school and, and certain set pieces, we were still kind of trying to push some things cinematically as much as we were able to. 
I, I have a question kind of for all three of you because you've all talked about static composition and and you're all working in television and and I'm just wondering if there's kind of a pushback in the camera world against uh, I, 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 I don't want to name names or whatever but there's like a procedural look where you've got like two cameras dollying in opposite directions or something like that and there's pointless movement there's there's movement that isn't really telling a story it might be building some tension and it makes it maybe a little fun to look at but is there a pushback uh, artistically uh, against that because I'll, Fern- Fern- I'll let Fernando start he's got a he's chopping it <laughs> no, no, this is this is a funny this is a very good question this is an awesome question because I've been through uh, this uh, <laughs> flavor flavor of the year camera thing that sometimes the directors come with um, you know there was uh, there was a moment I think like <laughs> in the uh, what is that it's like Sorry. this he, he was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he was demonstrating like, like, that all of a sudden <laughs> the, the whole desire of shooting the episodic was handheld. Okay, in every show you could do, there was pretty much all the directors wanted handheld. Now it's a little more static. I think this it goes in in waves somehow in in in, in uh, TV um, uh, the TV episodic. I my preference. I don't have a problem with the handheld when the handheld makes sense. I do have a problem with the handheld. It's just to get shots here and there, and then there's no control. You cannot control the lighting that's hitting the actors. You can you you uh, you, you you cannot uh, uh, show the 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 the, 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 the sets as they should be. I do have a little bit of an issue with the shoot everything, everything that he moves. Yeah. But it was me. It's, uh, uh, you know, the first uh, 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 new, I think this came from New York a little with those, uh, the directors doing the handheld style. The NYPD handheld. Blue. NYPD yeah, Blue. That was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. That, that's it. So, so, yeah. so, you know, I, my preference is a combination, but I like the static frame, as you said. Now it's using more and more uh, a static frame and camera moves uh, with traveling or or a very, uh, you know, that's my, my my preference. Okay, I'm not I saying think... Hanfel is wrong, but I'm telling you what is my preference. <laughs> no, and I think it's it's. Uh, I'll try and keep this short. I know we're running out of time. I'll try and mm-hmm. keep this short. I think it comes down to. For me, the all an extension of your earlier question, which is like, take reference from other material, things like that. It's a question of intention. If you're going to design how you're going to cover a scene and find a point of view in that style of filmmaking, then you want to be a bit restrictive. You want to pick where you want the camera, want to pick how you want to shoot the scene, how you want to, to look and see. Uh, and Watchroom was an ex- exercise in that. It's like, and, and some discipline. One, the thing when TV, when you don't have a lot of time, is you can't cover everybody. Uh, necessarily all the time and the other thing we have to balance in television is the ultimate director is also the showrunner usually and for someone like uh, Damon who writes incredibly fantastic dialogue he does enjoy having close-ups in all his other shows because he does cut close-ups so it's not something we can deprive him of that he's gonna cut that but it doesn't mean that we do it for every single thing all the time if we want to use a very specific composition to express part of a scene don't cover everything at the same time and you know make them uh give them too many options to cut out of it necessarily always if you want to have a design for it the like the ultimate expression of that in that series was the the black and white episode the this extraordinary mm-hmm. feeling which would had the sort of a long dreamlike view we were like it was written a bit like that and we were like we're going to embrace it and roll into it and spend all our time designing and choreographing the shots so we can make make them you won't want to cut out of it you won't feel like you're missing anything and then hopefully it will carry through but that was a design choice right and it was me and steve williams spending like you know <laughs> several weeks working all that out because of a design choice the thing about camera movement for no reason is like there's no there's not a design or an intent behind it and that's the thing i think that an audience an audience can feel fatigue watching a show even when there's lots of action and movement going on because it doesn't seem to have a focus do you know what i mean it's like create that and i think the pushback you're talking about is like yeah we'll all push back in like well we don't know why we're doing this i mean when tom's doing his thing he's finding the scene he's fine he's listening to the scene and deciding how he's going to put the camera he's making choices which will take the audience along and that's, you know what I mean? There's a choice there. Just because there's other things, if, if you randomly do it and no one is paying attention to the scene to pick the point of view, it's exhausting for the audience. It's not, it doesn't have the same feel watching it. There's a lot of pressure on set too, if you have bigger days. We generally, I think most TV shows probably have two cameras, an A and a B camera. And obviously, oh, yeah. um, you know, bigger days, maybe there's a third or fourth camera. 
you bring those cameras in on the bigger scenes you need, but there's always a pressure if you have a third or fourth camera laying around. The oh, director's yeah. like, well, why can't you fit it in over here? Why don't we just do this or that? And that I, sh- I shot of- three cameras on Moon Knight sometimes, right? It's a huge yeah, show. I'm still shooting stuff all the way with three cameras mm. on the room. It makes lighting hotter. Four? Also <laughs> is a less focused of- way of shooting, I think, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but guys, this is, okay, let's have more shots. You can only cut one shot, okay? It's only cut yep. one shot. But the whole thing is let's have more choices. So finally, yeah. they shoot in three cameras continuously. I've been in situations with four cameras. I can show you a picture. I, I was like, thank God that they were all in the same direction. But still, why yeah. four cameras? It's just and then, and more shots, more shots and, to edit. And also the also the other thing we forget is enough the timeline of those shows is not just us having less time the editors have less time if you give them that much material they will not be able to log and find the little moments and experiment with the 25 versions to to just think they don't have the time or energy it's too much to fit in their heads and you can sometimes Absolutely. drown in it and you then you wasted all the effort completely because they can't Absolutely. even find the shots that would be good i just finished a a, 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 a pilot guys with one camera the director and I, we decide to shoot it with one camera. Hmm. I cannot talk more about it because it's- Oh, uh, I was gonna ask you more. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, his name is uh, Darren Serafian. He's, uh, he's a known director, he's been around for years, one camera. And I tell you, we didn't miss anything. No. Do you think that sometimes there's like a weird machismo around like, oh, we did 60 setups today, but it was 62 <laughs> camera setups, so it's really 25 lighting setups. Definitely. But no, nobody sees that when they watch the show. They don't see Definitely. a page, a page exactly. on the thing. Yeah, here's the number of setups. Here's how many scenes. Nobody sees exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Nobody sees that. And, you know, you put there one shot. <laughs> yeah. That's what you <laughs> And then, you know, you have these three camera setups. I did a show called Scorpion. Scorpio, and we have six people talking around the table. Well, three cameras all the time. The only way you could light, because I like to, to have contracts and depth and composition, it was from the back and a little bit of fill. Back for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. And a little bit tough. of fill. There's no way to light for three cameras otherwise. Because no. the light coming this way is a yeah. shadow on the other guy. Yeah. And, you know, and the one thing about the one, not to feel like we're all dissing the multiple camera thing, because there are are distinct purposes for it when, like, for example, uh, if they're like, we had some stuff, but there's a lot of improv sometimes between characters on certain shows and getting matching coverage when they're changing the scene is incredibly invaluable. Like the scene can have a life that it would never have had if you had to then go back and redo coverage or something. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's a whole different, again, there's an intent to that, right? Cross cover a lot in the comedy world. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom, uh, between like the Parks and Rec and Office World and that sort of thing, uh, I I have to imagine a lot of that's got to be two cameras because otherwise the performance is just not going to be the the same every time. Parks and Rec, um, we pretty much cross covered almost everything because so much of the comedy is improvised at times. And if you have only one side of it, it's going to fall flat because you're never going to get that same moment or the same energy. Mm. You have to turn around and get it. So, so much of it is uh, in the coverage that you get. Um, You know, Saved by the Bell is different. And with comedies, uh, the one other angle of why there's so much coverage, especially with comedies, is so much of the funny is in the pacing. And so much of that pacing is sculpted in the edit. So mm. a lot of the producers and showrunners prefer to have as much covers as they can, because then they can sort of finesse those moments. Yeah, where they can comedy the doesn't really, yeah. there's, oh. there's not a lot of like <laughs> oneers in comedies that are hilarious. It's a lot of coverage. <laughs> They're editing for pace. It's almost like rhythmic, no, no. like music. But Tom, Tom, that's, that's perfectly fine. The thing is not only in comedy, also in drama. In some situations, they're asking for two or three cameras sometimes. And yeah. they're putting you because you have such a specific, specific dark, contrasty, sided, whatever it is, lighting, that all of a sudden when they put you that camera in that place, all of a sudden becomes flat as flat. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mm. understand your point perfectly. I just finished last this year, actually, um, uh, Princess Switch which is a comedy with uh, uh, Vanessa Hodges, Princess Switch 3. And it's a comedy, it's a rom-com. I shot it in Edinburgh. 
And, and, and I understand what you're saying. We have two cameras all the time because we need to have it, especially if she's playing three different characters. One actor plays three characters, so we need a lot of motion capture. We need, we need a lot of... It was a nightmare. But, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you're a nightmare. I will tell you this in private, a nightmare. So, so I understand the two-camera deal perfectly. And, you know, we try to play the two cameras so the light doesn't suffer that much. You know what I mean? It's that know that all of a sudden you fly one shot has some darkness and the other is flat. But uh, uh, in, in, in drama, in some situations, when you ask for three cameras, you know that one camera is going to be almost unusable lighting wise. That's my opinion. Yeah, it's true. I've I've been through it. I go through that almost you know a couple times on every job I do. There there are days where one angle is always sacrificed. And there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. No. Yeah. No. You do your best. Hey, uh, I, I, I want to I want to jump ahead a little bit here, uh, F- Fernando. Um, uh, Fear the Fear the Walking Dead. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just laughing. The three of us, the DP, we're all like, yeah, we're like, yeah, sacrifice. We were like, yeah, yeah. It it. If if we don't move on, it's going to be uh, time to break out the drinks because it's because uh, everyone's going to be lamenting that that third angle that just didn't work or wouldn't ever work. So anyway, uh, hey, I want to I want to uh, uh, throw in uh, Fear the Walking Dead here because uh, you're you're. You're working on a project that is an abstraction from another project that is, you know, beloved and is is on TV, which is an abstraction from the graphic novel. Uh, do you feel any? Uh, I mean, as the 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 author of the images, as the author of of uh, of the look of what you're doing, do you feel any responsibility to try to uh, be in the same world of the stuff that comes before, or do you get to kind of uh, be completely free? Because I know, like you know, uh, Walking Dead, uh, sixteen millimeter. Rainy. They they have a very specific look, and the comic books very stylized. W- when you come to this, how, how what's your what's your approach? What's your feeling? How how do you, how do you get into all that? I I, I came on, on season seven, and that was the only season I, I did uh, for a specific for some personal reasons and uh, uh, personal reasons I didn't keep going with the show. But uh, in another season, I don't know if it's going to be another season. But season seven. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it is completely different than the rest they did before. Season seven happens after a nuclear, nuclear explosion. In, mm. So even the zombies <laughs> are nuclear in this case. So so nuclear uh, we zombies. Did, yeah, we we created uh, a, a completely new looking show with a showrunner, completely new, uh, 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 have nothing to do, has nothing to do with the previous years, if that is your question. We, uh, the colors were way much more contrast. There were a lot of orange, heavy, 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 thick oranges, uh, uh, high, high contrast. Um, so it, it, it had nothing to do with the other years. It was new it, because that wasn't in the graphic novel. There was not that I know of, there was no expo- uh, nuclear explosion, uh, uh, maybe at some point, but I, the, the, nobody showed me anything as such. All right. Well, uh, I, I was just wondering if the, if that conversation comes up, if, if like you have to at least make it seem like it's the same world or you get to be completely creative and, and essentially go off from there. I think both of them. I think we we got some of the the previous years, but really the look, the colors, uh, they were they were pretty much different than the the, the previous years. Yes, sir. And we did a lot of testing, by the way. Yeah? We did some very serious testing. What what kind of testing were you know the the usual sort of stuff, hair, makeup, camera, or or something? Okay. I did uh, lighting, quite a bit of light, lighting tests with different gels, different colors at night using uh, um, yellow combined with blue to create a kind of a greenish uh, weird moonlighting. Uh, we did for night, we did for day, we did for the stage day, for the stage night, exteriors night and day and all of that kind of stuff. 
Wow, that that, that sounds that sounds like a, a, a tremendous amount of of prep work, uh, uh, and clearly cl- clearly it paid off. Um, uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, I want to just quickly throw to everyone here: um, Is there a project or something in particular, a topic we didn't get to talk about that you wanted to bring up here in the in the final minutes? So we can we can certainly do a speed round if you want, and we can kind of you know jump into this, or you know, I'll give you I'll give you guys the option if uh, if there's something you want to chat about. I always feel like, like, you know, like I'll go in with an agenda and there's always a project that, that you've done that doesn't get enough love or something that, that would be worth bringing up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Hemlock Grove didn't get enough, uh, recognition for uh, the, 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 the look that we created in that show and what we intended to do with that show. Uh, and uh, I I don't know why. I don't know what it really happened. I think it's because Netflix was new. It's streaming. It like people, early people, days. People early didn't days have the, Netflix, the habit yeah. of streaming yet. I mean, we, 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 we came up with things like studying all the scenes using 12 millimeter lens, very Kubrick, Kubrick, Kubrick uh, you know, uh, still, still very low, very symmetric. Um, you know, I, that's what I, what I think. So, but I don't want to extend on that. You guys. <laughs> well, it's definitely right, still right. on Netflix, so it's, it's worth checking out. Sure. All right. All right. I don't mean to throw you on the spot, but Tom, you you got something you wanna you wanna you know, throw into our lightning round here? The lightning round answer for me is there was a show I did a couple years ago for TBS that was a comedy that was a parody on the one hour police procedural. It was called Angie Tribeca, and it was oh yeah, yeah so great. The the writing was incredible. It was very much like Airplane or the old Police Squad naked gun shows, and with the cinematography that we were told to do was almost one hour drama, really dark stuff. So. It, was, it didn't run as many seasons as I had hoped. It was so much fun to do, but hopefully it, it still has a life out there, and I'm very proud of that show. Awesome. awesome. Greg, you want to you wanna jump in? I think I just mentioned two things I mentioned at the beginning. One was the first film I shot, Kissed, a little tiny film, which I Love think I don't film. know where it is. Hard to find. It might be on, it's on YouTube somewhere, but... I believe I saw it at a at a film festival. Like it might have been at the Florida Film Festival. Oh, actually, yeah. you know what? Because Lynn and I are discussing, we're going to try and maybe do a four K restoration of it, like a proper transfer. Because the I think the uh, it's being handed back from the American distributor now after twenty five years. So we're going to maybe try and do that. So maybe oh, that'll come out so. again. And then the other thing is the project I was going to mention was the uh, I talked about the killing, just because it was a a very very dark TV series, similar to what we were discussing before, where we got to shoot in a more cinematic way. I shot seasons two, three, and four. Um, and I had to work with some really interesting independent uh, directors where we really embraced some of what we all said before. We got a chance, like Fernando said earlier, where you suddenly felt like, like I felt I could become, like I was still shooting, like a, being a cinematographer for, you know, like on a film, even though we're working on a series. You know, it was, it was approached the same kind of way with a, an amazingly empowering boss, Vino Sud, and an amazing filmmakers like Nikki Cassell and Ed Bianchi. And, I got to work with Jonathan Demi, and oh, uh, wow. that it was a bit more of a you know we could shoot through a glass with the entire thing in a two shot right and use a reflection for an entire scene or things like that and it was a anyway for me it was a it was a sort of a a birth of like that that being able to do that kind of artistry or that type of intention in work that was still basically a police drama a very dark police drama but. Well, uh, before we go, let's uh, let's let's ask each one of you, like, where can people see your work? Obviously, your work is on all the streaming services, but you have a website, Instagram, Twitter. Where can people find you, interact with you, maybe? Uh, and uh, let's if start they with can. you, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess I'm on Instagram. I think I'm just Gregory Middleton, ASACSC, I think, on there, or Middlecam. Um, I don't use any other social media than that. I haven't posted in a long while, but I'll start posting a bunch of uh moon Knight stuff coming up as the release is coming up i don't know when this is going to be we're this is going to be out i think during the during the episodes are going to be out um and that's about it and um yeah and gregory middleton dot no i you know i have to find out my website <laughs> so I, it's on, ah! it's on <laughs> i remember i might change the address but uh what about you tom uh i don't think i exist at all i don't have uh i have a, i don't have any public social media accounts i don't have a website yet i've been working on it for like the last 20 years just trying to find stuff uh if you want to see some of my work if you really had the time you could check my imdb out and then watch a couple of the shows if you feel like it was up your alley yeah. that's, that's kind of it imdb is a great resource for all this stuff oh god yeah i, I can't i can't imagine life without imdb um what about you fernando um, just the um, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Fernando Arguelles, ASC, or, and uh, Fer- FernandoArguelles.net. 
which is my website, and it has, you know, pieces of my work, not all the work, you know, it's just uh, from all the shows, except the last couple, it's, um, you know, just little segments here and there. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, uh, thank you all so much for coming on here. It's it's been great to to talk to all of you. I'm uh, hopefully we'll have you uh, each individually on the show again at some other uh, point in time, and uh, uh, just amazing work around around the the horn here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for all the. Th- thank you for the interest in our work. By the way, you guys have an amazing podcast. I've been a fan of it for years, so it's oh, great. Thank uh, thanks so much for uh, you know taking the time to speak to us and let us oh explain God. a bit about what we do. Thank you. Yeah. No, no. Thank you. Love, thank you, guys. Thank you, Greg. That's great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it was so much fun. Okay. Do it again. Yeah, we'll do it again. <laughs> mm-hmm.